now. And we are set. So uh, Dr. Quintero, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Monday seminar. I think this is about our eighth seminar uh, this semester in, uh, in, in, in global health. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsorship of the Institute of Health and Humanities, uh, the Global Public Health Minor, as well as the Community and Public Health Sciences Program here at UM for um, you know, sponsoring this, uh, this wonderful seminar series. Um, just a reminder, next week, April 5th, we will have a, a, a PhD candidate, uh, Juthika Thaker is going to be talking about some of her research, giving us an update. Uh, in a talk entitled Engaging Non-Physician Healthcare Personnel and Improving uh, HPV Vaccination Rates in Montana. For today, um, our, our guest speaker is uh, Patrick Lynn. Uh, Patrick works as a management consultant at LMI, uh, our Logistics Management Institute, where he helps lead teams that develop and implement strategies for organizations across the federal government. Um, prior to uh, uh, working as a consultant, uh, Patrick served in the US Peace Corps uh, for two years in Senegal where he uh, engaged in an environmental and community health initiative that addressed uh, mercury use in artisanal small scale gold mining. Um, and he also worked partnering with uh, community health workers uh, within uh, the context of a village level malaria surveillance uh, uh, project. He has also uh, interned for U.S. Senator John Tester, uh, Senator from Montana, and served with AmeriCorps VISTA as a Youth Build Program Officer in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, he has a BA in History from Montana State University in Bozeman and an MPA in Development and Health Policy from Princeton University. Um, so please uh, help me welcome uh, Patrick Lynn. Uh, today, his presentation is entitled, All That Glitters, Mer Mercury and Gold in the Sahel. And with that, uh, Patrick, uh, again, welcome, and I will uh, turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Quintero, and thank you, Patrick, and thank you to the Global um, Public Health Program at U of M. Really grateful for the opportunity to share um, some experiences that I've had working on this important issue that I think maybe <clears throat> flies under the radar in some global health discourses. And it really is a issue of considerable import for environmental health um, for a lot of communities around the world, especially in low resource settings. So with that, I'll be sharing the results from um, this educational and appropriate technology intervention. Uh, that I engaged in um, in southeastern Senegal in a region called Kedegu in a health district health district called Saria, which is the sort of center of gravity for gold mining in the country of Senegal. So I'm just going to advance forward and talk quickly about mercury a little bit. <clears throat> so. Um, the global gold mining industry relies on um, industrial mining or artisanal small scale mining or somewhere along the continuum of um, gold exploit exploitation. There are probably more than 10 million artisanal small scale gold miners in the world. In Senegal, they make up the vast majority of miners and they're responsible for maybe 10% of the global gold um, that's excavated. 
in Senegal, it's hard to measure the share of gold that is produced by artisanal miners compared to industrial miners uh, because they're not regulated. Um, taxes aren't levied on the gold um, and folks sell it on the black market. The issue that I'm going to be talking about is the interaction of mercury with artisanal small scale gold mining. And I'll get into how that all works and why it's used and the way it's used by just uh, zooming out, looking at the big picture, something like well over a thousand tons of mercury are released by artisanal small scale gold miners globally each year. When I was doing this work in 2013, that number was estimated at 650 um, tons of mercury. So it's likely more than doubled. Um, and this um, emissions from gold mining are the largest single anthropogenic source for mercury emissions greater than coal um, burning, likely based on our estimates. There's some other issues um, with artisanal small scale gold mining. It's not all problems. You know, this brings a lot of wealth to communities that haven't historically had access to a lot of wealth. Um, but some of the problems associated with artisanal small scale gold mining are child labor explo exploitation. Um, some share, depending on the community, of mine workers are children, school aged children, and sometimes even younger. And um, they're engaging in work that can be really hazardous. Um, climbing into 100 meter deep pits um, that aren't reinforced, um, that can collapse. Um, they can be injured just with the tools that they're using and they're being exposed to um, all kinds of possibly dangerous dusts in the air um, and mercury emissions. Other issues uh, commonly associated with mining are sanitation issues. Oftentimes this mining takes place in places with um, very limited water infrastructure and sanitation infrastructure. Um, I'll be talking about a village that I was quite familiar with that had this issue in a big way um, when I lived there. There are also issues um, with sex trafficking. There are issues with um, influx of drugs. These communities are oftentimes, um, you know, wild west boom towns that um, originate in a village of maybe a couple hundred people that can grow to a village of or a city of 40 or 50,000 people um, with zero original infrastructure. So you can imagine what, you know, tens of thousands of 16 to 35 year old um, youngish people get up to. Um, it can just be pretty wild. There's also issues of landscape degradation, lots of deforestation. Um, there's pollution. One of the common methods for separating gold from ore is cyanide heap leach mining. Um, that tends to be um, done on the tailings from mining that um, used ore processing using mercury. And I can talk about that in a minute. And then finally, um, key issue that I'll be talking about is the issue of chronic and ac acute exposure to elemental mercury which has um, a secondary effect of community exposure to methyl mercury, organic mer mercury that's methylated by anaerobic bacteria um, in the soil, but mostly in the water um, that gets into the trophic chain. So those are some issues um, with mining. This is an image that you're seeing right now that I took of a mine um, a couple hour bike ride from where I lived. This is an industrial mine. This is um, where most of the global capital in gold mining goes to 300 ton trucks, hauling huge amounts of ore, digging, the, um, digging deep into the ground. A village used to be propped right in the middle of where this big pit is. And the village was moved by the mining company. There were protests. There were people um, who were injured by bulldozers. It was ugly. Um, this mine also, has to follow environmental regulations. Every tree that is removed by this mine has to be replanted. Um, anytime there's an animal killed, maybe a snake is driven over by a truck, all mining stops and an inquiry is conducted to find out what happened and why. Um, so there are some rules of the road, but clearly there are major impacts to traditional um, industrial scale mining. 
this is a picture of what artisanal small scale mining looks like. Um, to the right, carrying the two water jugs is my host father from, from my community training where I um, learned the language Malinke, the language predominantly spoken in this community. And uh, miners use little hand pickaxes like what I'm holding. Um, and they just excavate the laterite, lateritic soil um, with these little picks. Um, I wasn't a miner. I didn't engage in mining, but um, I visited my host father and he said, you got to try it. Um, so a good friend of mine took a picture of me just standing in a small pit, but this is kind of a common image of what you would see in an artisanal small scale gold mine anywhere in the world. Um, just people doing a lot of um, hand labor, hauling water, um, filling rice sacks with ore. Um, this is a photo of a village called Harahena. It was a few dozen kilometers from the village that I lived in and my host father had family who lived here. When I started my Peace Corps service, this village had about 300 residents. There were no tarps on huts. It was all traditional, real pretty, cute little huts. Lots of trees. Um, this picture was taken early in 2013 after large amounts of gold were discovered um, not far from where chimpanzees live in some of the northernmost um, chimpanzee inhabiting areas on the continent of Africa. And there are also wild lions in this area. It's a sensitive um, ecological environment. There were probably 5,000 people living here at this time, up from 300. When we left our service at the end of or in 2014, a UN estimate um, pegged the number of miners at, I think, 30 to 50,000 miners. Um, there was one hand pump for water in the village. Um, it was being operated 24 hours a day and broke down a lot. Um, there was very little formal sanitation with the use of pit latrines. Consequently, there was a large hepatitis E outbreak um, that killed a lot of people, um, one who I knew. And so this is kind of the image of these like boom towns. Um, it, you know, it just so you have a visual. Um, this is a photo taken of a couple of kids in a village called Cosanto, which was probably an hour and a half bike ride from where I served in the Peace Corps. Um, on the left is what's called a gravity table that's used to sluice um, mercury or gold ore. Um, and these are some children just playing in a uh, tailings heap. It, this is a much more, um, this is what a village looks like, you know, um, thatched roof huts, um, mud wall huts, not a lot of um, tarps laying around. Anyhow, um, so that's a visual of um, what artisanal small scale gold mining um, looks like just in short. So we conducted some data gathering activities and I'll be getting into those briefly in a little bit, but just some summary um, stats about um, what we found at the baseline. So in the district of Saria where we lived, um, among those who are minors who consider themselves minors, the majority of them um, who consider themselves minors burn mercury about once a week. Um, most Gold smelting, hence mercury burning, occurs inside a hut or a compound. The home is not just the hut, um, the kind of walled compound, the woven bamboo walls um, are part of the home too. So most of the mining occurs in private residences or most of the gold smelting. And um, most people who are asked have a sense that mercury is dangerous. So that's what we went into this. Um, educational intervention and appropriate technology distribution with the knowledge of. And um, those were, there were some behaviors there that we really um, hoped to address. Um, we wanted to, we aimed for lower harm approaches to gold extraction um, via the appropriate technology, a closed circuit smelting technique um, called a pipe retort and relocation of burning sites to the edges of communities rather than in the home. And um, just so you can have a better sense of what the um, gold extraction process looks like, I'm gonna provide a quick visual walkthrough of what it looks like. So a typical miner 
Um, and these are all photos taken by Peace Corps volunteers, myself or another volunteer who I worked with. And these were um, folks that um, we generally had some relationships with. Um, but uh, uh, a miner will carry his ore in a rice sack back to a village, some kind of kind of centralized place. And the rock is smashed to gravel just by hand. Then it's put through what looks like a millet grinder or a peanut grinder, but just a, a grinder um, to make a sort of sand. In French, that's sable. The, the sandy sedimentous um, result from the milling is put on a sluice, a gravity table um, that's covered with a carpet and water is run down it and the heavier kind of bold particles will generally settle out into the carpet. Um, that carpet is washed then in a wash basin just using dish soap and uh, a gold bearing sediment is left behind. This is a picture of the bottom of one, they call them Benoit, um, plastic laundry basin. And you can see the line of yellow that's of just a small amount of gold from that sand. Um, next, for whatever reason, mercury is carried in vitamin C um, tubes. It's carried in little plastic bags. It's carried lots of ways, but uh, maybe these tubes are less likely to spring a leak. Um, so vitamin C tube um, with, that's probably 40 grams of mercury. Um, you dump it into the wash basin and then mix it around with your hands and really try to press it into the sediment. And then you pour um, what was in the wash basin out into a just a little bit of cloth and then you squeeze that cloth and the, the mercury binds to the gold in that sediment and forms a little amalgam, mercury gold amalgam. That's a little bit yellowish, you can't really see on the screen, I don't know, and really silver. Um, it's pretty soft. And that amalgam, you put it on a spoon or a plate or in best case scenario in a closed circuit smelting tool like a pipe retort um, or a direct smelting unit. And you heat it up and the mercury evaporates into the air, leaving behind 80 or 90 percent pure gold. Um, the amalgam is typically heated with a torch it can be heated on a stove. The stoves that it would be heated with are tea stoves, just little small metal stoves with coal. And you just heat your tea up there. Um, you can also heat your mercury gold amalgam on that stove. Um, oftentimes it's done in the household, as mentioned, for security reasons largely, and people are pretty private about the amount of gold they have or they found or they've purified because of security concerns. Um, <clears throat> let's see, oftentimes a gold buyer um, will be somewhere in the mix. A gold buyer will sell the miner mercury, and then the miner will sell gold back to the gold buyer. Mercury is oftentimes overpriced, though it's still very cheap. And gold is oftentimes sold pretty close to the global spot price for really rough gold because people have access to the information of what gold costs, and if needed, Miners can travel to Dakar and sell um, in a more wholesale context. Um, the picture on the bottom right is a gold buyer scale. They'll oftentimes people have these scales on the back of their bicycles and they're just riding from village to village. It's a very hazardous activity, not just because you're burning mercury and exposed to mercury all the time, but also um, because there's less rule of law in these communities and you're exposed to. Um, lay bandy bandits. Uh, oftentimes it wasn't uncommon to hear about people having the tires shot out from their motorcycle as they're riding and um, to be robbed at gunpoint. And this was an area that didn't have very many guns and has traditionally been known for being really, really peaceful. So it was, um, it was a big change to the culture. Um, the gold exploitation has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe over a thousand years. But the 
large gold discoveries occurred in 2007, 2008. It's relatively new. Um, people started coming from outside the country in 2009, 2010, largely. So the influx of new gold mining techniques, um, influx of you know outsiders, that was all kind of new to the culture. Moving forward, I'm gonna talk quickly about the intervention that we conducted. Um, now that you have a sense for what gold pro processing looks like in the context of artisanal small-scale gold mining in Senegal. So the intervention that we um, engaged with consisted of public educational talks about the risks of mercury exposure and ways to reduce exposure in small-scale mining circumstances. Um, you know, some of these villages were a few hundred people, somewhere, like I said, tens of thousands of people. Every time a miner burns mercury, there's at least 10 grams, maybe 20 grams, maybe 40 grams of mercury in the amalgam being burned. If you have 10,000 people burning once a week, um, 10 or 20 grams of mercury, a lot is going into the air. Um, I, I have a friend who just finished a PhD working on this actually, and she worked a little bit to estimate um, the distribution of elemental mercury after it um, is burned. It's really hard to know how much goes into the atmosphere and deposits on oceans, but a lot does. You know, we know that eating tuna um, a lot can be hazardous for a child's health or a pregnant woman's health um, because of methyl, methyl mercury. That methyl mercury um, is in tuna because of gold mining and burning of coal. Um, and that um, anaerobic methylation process that I mentioned earlier. Um, but a lot of the mercury stays in the community. Um, uh, it coats the earth, it coats um, the ground. It's unclear um, how much methylated mercury is um, found in some of the plants grown um, in these, these areas, but there certainly is some. Um, it um, coats waters and gets into the... Um, uh, trophic phases and is in the fish um, and then is, is on surfaces. It's sticky, um, it attaches to the dirt. Eventually it will get covered over by other dust and sediments, but um, erosion will wear it away and expose it again. Highly toxic neurotoxin. Um, it causes, I didn't mention um, exactly what the health effects are, but um, neurological damage, um, damage to your solid organs, um, damage to vision, damage to your gingiva, you develop a tremor, develop an ataxia of gait, um, insomnia, problems with memory. There are lots of, lots of issues. So anyhow, um, our intervention consisted of um, a training of trainers model that sought to educate um, people in mining communities about the risks of um, being exposed to mercury especially to high-risk people, um, children and pregnant women are the people considered to be of highest risk um, and exposure to elemental mercury. Um, talked about the importance of decreasing open pan burning, increasing closed circuit smelting. Um, this was done, like I said, through a training of trainers approach. We didn't um, conduct public trainings or anything as Peace Corps volunteers. Our collaborators and partners didn't either. Um, this was all done by um, community health workers who are engaged with us, and I'll talk about the collaborations in just a minute. But we had eight trainers, 47 peer educators, and there were 11 villages in total, um, three pilot villages and eight um, test program villages. The trainer activities um, included these public talks um, and um, supervision of the peer educators and weekly um, kind of trainings. They were paid for this. And the um, peer educator activities, we called them pair, um, were that they would bring a retort that they were um, provided with and instructed in proper use to their mining areas and encouraged to use them and to encourage others to use them and try to um, sort of spur some demand for this technology and um, for also uh, protecting a community. So there's an image of a map here. This map is the district of Saria um, in 
or it's the region of Ketagu. And um, a lot of the, those gold dots are largely in the district of Saria. Um, Saria is the largest health district, I think in the country um, by territory, but one of the smallest in population in Senegal and um, one of the most um, rugged in terrain. Um, and those kind of like mountainous areas when eroded down reveal these really old rocks containing um, gold, et cetera. Also uranium, um, Senegal has a lot of uranium. Okay, so that is the intervention that we um, engaged with. This is just a diagram of what um, the training of trainers model looked like. Um, one health worker called an ISA, um, a trained community health worker in the formal health system. In each village was trained um, by the Peace Corps volunteers working in collaboration with the district health center staff, um, supervised by the district health center staff. Um, they were taught a series of behavior change techniques, um, uh, an array of facts, and um, uh, a series of techniques um, that they could um, pass on to their um, colleagues and community members. Um, <clears throat> like I said, each, each trainer gave one public talk a week. They supervised the peer educators. They had kind of a um, core team of peer educators that they were assigned to supervise. Um, they, uh, we got um, a series of educational posters that kind of provided the key points that um, the team felt was important, laminated, and those were provided to the ISA, the community health workers, and they were able to use those in their weekly causeries, their public talks. Um, the intervention lasted for three weeks in each village, um, and the trainers and peers were both compensated at um, levels specified by the health system for this level of work. Um, this is an image of, this is three images of pipe retorts. The retort on the left is the model used um, and promulgated by an organization called the Artisanal Gold Council. Um, it uses a stainless steel tube, um, a stainless steel pipe end cap called a crucible and it's threaded and welded together and then just put on this welded um, piece of rebar. So you can see um, that crucible is smaller than the size of a ping pong ball. It's pretty, pretty small. And when it heats up, um, the threads bind and it's really hard to um, untwist it after it's been heated up. So you have to cool it off. It takes a lot of time. Um, and the heavier um, crucible bowl um, took a long time to heat up. Oftentimes a blowtorch was used. Um, blowtorch gas is expensive. It was not an optimal solution. Um, those, that, that was the first set of retorts that we used. We, um, we were trying to, you know, we were gathering data as we were, um, as this intervention was running, found out early on that there were problems with retort and worked with a local technical high school team, um, Lycee Technique to design um, a better model of retort. Um, the one in the middle is um, a steel stand that um, has a ring in it. And you set a rice bowl into the ring and then you set a heavy plate that's an old car brake, disc brake um, on top of um, the cover of that rice bowl. And then there are some notches. You can put a bolt in and really squeeze it. There's a little rubber gasket to keep gas from coming out. And we have the same Tube. So the pipes that are in the retort on the left, we sourced from Canada um, because we had a lot of trouble finding this spec of material in Senegal. Well, it turns out that broken refrigerators, the back of them, the coolant pipes are the same diameter. And so the Lise technique was able to use those and much, much more cheaply produce retorts that work a lot better, that can handle much larger amalgams, um, that can be built locally, and that can be set over a cold burning um, tea stove and heated without the use of gas, um, more surface area, easier to open and close, all those things. So the way that the retort works is the mercury um, becomes gaseous, travels down the pipe. Um, the bottom of the pipe is set in a pail of water um, once the gaseous mercury hits the water, it condenses and can be recuperated, can be pulled back out of that water and reused. 
Um, it also prevents it from remaining in a gaseous state. And then what's left over in the crucible is 80 to 90% gold. So this um, current version of the retort um, has been improved on since. Um, my colleague, my Peace Corps colleague who continued working on this for their PhD worked with a similar, some of the same collaborators and continued to iterate on this design and it's being sold um, locally in some of the gold mining areas and um, they apparently they can't keep up with demand. They can only make so many and there are tens of thousands of miners, but it's good that there's demand. That was, that was something we were really hoping to see happen. <clears throat> so that is the appropriate technology intervention. There was the educational intervention um, run by the OSA and the um, pairs, the peer educators. Then there's the collaborative approach to a, a project like this. Um, the first and most important collaborator on a project um, in a community um, in Senegal, say, that we worked in is the local health system. Um, they need to be informed from the beginning. Ideally, they need to be um, in a managerial role. Um, they should be um, involved in IRB um, submission and development of proposals and all kinds of plans. <clears throat> so we were fortunate that we had a really involved medicine chef to post. His name was Dr. Yusuf Njai. And uh, he, from the very start of the idea, he was um, uh, involved in conversations. He helped develop um, the survey that was used. And he approved um, the plan. He um, delegated um, um, people to support um, the initiative, drivers, um, infirmier chef de post. Um, those are nurses who run um, health posts in smaller villages. And um, Absolutely integral. There were, there have been um, mercury focused interventions in this community and others that didn't involve um, the formal health system. And you would hear about them and that the health system was not impressed or happy to see parallel programs being run without guidance, um, without any kind of control, without assurance of local. Um, sensibilities. It's like, from my perspective, that's the most important thing. Um, the, the initial posture of this kind of work is um, to not contribute to harm. And that requires um, local management, basically. Okay, so that was, um, that's the first key element of our collaborative approach. The second was, um, it required funding um, there's a desk in the State Department focused entirely on mercury, and they provided about 15 million SAFA, which is um, some thousands of dollars um, to fund this work um, over the course of several years. Um, we had a team from Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel of um, medical students um, and uh, a statistician and um, a, pub, a global public health um, professor were heavily involved. Um, one of those medical students had actually been a Peace Corps volunteer in the community of Saria um, a couple years before us. And um, he was integral um, to this project, both from an ideation perspective and um, helping kick it off. Um, and that also brought a level of um, analytical rigor that was really valuable and important. And finally, um, least important, but I think still quite important were the Peace Corps volunteers who were there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my wife and I, my wife, Annie, um, who was actually involved in the um, global health program at U of M, um, and myself were in the, living in the village of Saria, um, working at the district health center, um, as um, health health focused Peace Corps volunteers, and we had a team of 
a couple of other volunteers who either lived in mining villages or lived near mining villages or had specific interest in seeing environmental health issues um, be addressed in some way. So um, we developed materials, we um, managed uh, the funding pass through um, from Artisanal Gold Council who um, received the funding directly from State Department. And um, we integrated with the community health workers. Um, we spoke the local language. Um, so we were in a position to be able to be involved at a pretty granular level. We were really fortunate um, to have, but like I said, we couldn't have done it and we shouldn't have done it without the IG of the um, health center. So um, health center drivers would drive us to the far away villages when they would be going um, to maybe uh, resupply a health, um, a health post in one of these villages. Or if a ICP was traveling back and forth between Sari and the village, we would um, occasionally be able to get there um, in one of their um, land cruisers. Otherwise, we would bike. Um, we had mountain bikes. So that is the collaborative approach. Now, some challenges. Um, as you can imagine, um, there, were, there were a range of challenges um, to this work. The most important was probably um, the fact of the social and cultural dislocation that the gold mining brought to these communities. Um, communities that were pretty homogenous ethnically suddenly had people from 10 other countries living in the outskirts of the community who didn't speak any of the same languages, <clears throat> whose sole purpose was um, to extract resources from their farm fields. Um, so there were, there were major challenges with um, having outsiders around. There were, like I said before, the issue of banditry, um, the security challenges around that. Um, there, there was kind of a general cloud of suspicion. We tried to ourselves, the Peace Corps volunteers, um, not visually associate ourselves with this intervention. Um, it was important to the um, effectiveness, I think, of the work of the community health workers and the peer educators, um, that they were publicly and visibly associated with the district health system, um, but not with Peace Corps. Um, we, we didn't deny if we were asked that we were supporting this, but um, it, was, it was just important for a number of reasons that this was a locally driven initiative. Um, there were some complexities to collaborations. One of the collaborations I didn't mention was um, some of the supervisions of the health workers that needed to take place to confirm that these public talks had occurred. Obviously, we weren't going there. Um, to do that um, because that would possibly risk um, reducing the effectiveness of the public talk, um, stoking suspicion of why this person is telling us to use a less efficient means of um, extracting our gold. Like, are they trying to slow down our work, say? Are they um, representatives of the big industrial mining companies who want us off of the land that they leased but we're living on? Um, that they have mineral rights too, but we have ancestral rights too. Etc. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we worked with uh, Red Crescent and World Vision, who had um, uh, local national staff and local staff that were local to the region, um, who supported um, some of the um, supervision to make sure that these talks were actually happening. It was tough. There were some problems with that approach. I can get into those in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but that's, those were challenges. Now about the data. So this is a picture um, of me sitting next to survey one after we had finished data entry. Um, each survey consisted of 600, um, 105 question surveys that were um, conducted um, in these, in a range of villages. There were three um, pilot villages and eight formal test villages. <clears throat> the data from the eight villages is what we used um, for the operational research component of the survey. Um, it was 
conducted between November of 2012 and October of 2013, the data gathering the intervention, the whole thing. Um, and the surveys employed questions on demographics, personal history with gold mining, mining behavior, beliefs, and knowledge. Um, and the surveys took the form of two baseline surveys. Um, they were pre-intervention in the wet season and the dry season respectively, because we suspected that um, there would be different patterns of um, people living in the communities um, and patterns of activity in the different seasons. And then two inline post-intervention surveys, um, also seasonally specific. Um, miners are largely transient. They're moving around, especially during these different seasons. Um, and we suspected that the demographics in the communities would change um, during these seasonal changes. All the surveys were conducted by trained local enquêteurs, that's surveyors in French, supervised by community health workers in Saria, um, health district personnel. Um, and the data collection and educational intervention, um, like I said before, was conducted with the full support of the district health center. Um, Dr. Njai validated every question that was included on the survey. Um, the surveys were translated in the local language. That was really important. Um, due to um, technical problems um, with a couple of the surveyors, um, we ended up having to drop the data from round one, um, the first survey. So we only used um, the round two pre-intervention dry season survey, and then the round three and four post-intervention surveys um, in the final analysis. Um, I could talk more about some of our um, motivating assumptions about this, um, but um, I've been talking a bunch. Um, just quickly about the analytical model that I used um, to cut through the data. Um, my outcomes were risk behavior, signs and symptoms, personal protection, and predictor variables I used for a survey round two, three, or four, um, local ethnic group, binary variable, um, interaction variable survey round by local ethnic interaction, um, education level, marital status, gender, village, nationality, and occupation, um, minor or non-minor. Um, so I'm not a statistician. I did this analysis when I was in grad school. Um, and, um, created um, indexes um, to average responses on risk behavior, signs and symptoms, um, personal protection. If someone thinks um, mercury is dangerous, if so, how do they protect themselves from it? Um, there's a lot I could get into. I used fix, a village fixed effects model to try to isolate. Um, uh, to try and control for average differences and unobservable factors across villages. Um, but that's not super interesting. Here are some quick summary stats. Um, 11 total villages received this intervention. There were 47 peer educators trained. Um, there were 56 retorts distributed um, in this three, three week rollout. Since then, um, many more have been distributed. Um, there, were, there was a count of 832 people who attended the talks put on by the OSA. And then there were a logged um, 17,000 informal peer educational exchanges. Um, <clears throat> here are some stats about um, who some of these people in these mining, in these 11 mining villages, well, eight mining villages were in 2012 and 2013. <clears throat> um, most, a plurality considered themselves to be minors. Um, a majority were um, male. Um, education literacy levels were not super different from um, averages across the wider communities. Um, and at the time that we did the survey, um, a majority were Malinke speaking. That's the language that we spoke. Um, it's similar to Jalonke and Jahanke. Um, they're kind of cousin languages, very different from Pular and Wolof. Um, Bambra is really similar to Malinke, Jalanke, and Jahanke. Um, and a majority were Senegalese. We presume that um, these numbers will have changed a lot in the years since um, this intervention. 
Um, this is uh, a crosstab of ethnicity and occupation. Um, most Malinkes are farmers. That's something we knew. Pularis tend not to be farmers. They tend to be, um, um, they tend to have livestock um, and to be um, in herding occupations. Um, happy to share this if anyone wants to look at this later. Um, I'll just move forward and share initial results. Um, we pulled um, from this um, multivariate regression analysis, found that locals don't tend to show significant increases in knowledge levels after the inter intervention. Non-locals tend to show higher knowledge levels after the intervention. Um, it's a substantive difference, but not necessarily a statistically significant difference. And locals do not show significantly higher knowledge level effects than non-locals after the intervention. Um, in general, non-locals were a more receptive audience to public health campaigns related to the primary, minors' primary occupations. Um, that kind of um, fit well with one of our hypotheses that locals were farmers who were mining on the side and non-locals were people who had picked up from their previous life and relocated here and were more serious um, about mining, considered themselves professional miners, and therefore were more um, informed about and interested about some of the technical aspects of mining. Um, so something to be aware of and to keep in mind if you're ever involved in intervention like this there. Um, it's, it's possible that there's differentials in receptivity um, to a knowledge intervention. So next steps that um, we had hoped to see and still hope to see in this type of industry is formalization of the activity um, by creation of co-ops that can both provide security and protection for miners um, by having um, sort of authorized gold, gold buyers in an area who have some kind of protection when they're leaving. Um, for communities to have secure places to um, smelt their mercury gold amalgams um, using closed circuit smelting or direct smelting techniques um, without even the use of mercury if possible. Um, there's, there's a new-ish in the last 10 years or maybe 20 years, I don't know by now, um, certification called Fair Mind. It kind of follows um, fair trade. Um, it provides a premium kind of like buying organic corn or something um, on the price of the gold um, that could be sold and that's sponsored by there's a um, global international institutional um, collaborative called the alliance for responsible mining that's funded um, by multilateral organizations um, that contributes to this fair mine certification um, we encourage um, people engaging in um, this kind of intervention to both engage with the local health system but also with the gold buyers. The gold buyers are the primary locus of um, mercury in the communities. They're bringing, they're biking the mercury into the communities. <clears throat> and um, we encourage um, dialogue between industrial miners and small scale miners um, to try to find um, a way to balance interests um, when they're both in competition for a similar resource. Um, try to not drive it underground, um, try to make it public, regulated, fair, safe, if possible. This is an activity that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, what we believed was that um, a risk reduction approach made sense. Um, others could argue, but um, that, was, that was my take at least at the time. And then I have some references from some of the stats that I have. So with that, um, I'd love to spend the last 10 or so minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, very, very interesting. So yes, let's open up the floor to, uh, to questions. Uh, anybody out there want to ask a question? Maybe uh, turn on your camera, unmute yourself, if not, you could put the question in the uh, in the chat. Thanks, Gil. I'd, I'd like to ask Patrick a question. Um, Hi, Peter. Um, 
Yeah, this is fascinating. It's one of the most sophisticated Peace Corps projects I've, I've ever seen. Uh, I, I really applaud you and Annie for having had the wherewithal to, to do all of that while you were there. Um, you know, when I teach my development administration class, when I teach my issues in global health class, I stress the idea of sustainability. And one of the things that I like about your project was the emphasis on training of trainers. So my question is, you know, is there, have you studied at all the sustainability of that? Has that, um, imp, has that impact of training the trainers been sustainable over time since when you left? That's a great question, Peter, thanks. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to say. We left right as there were shutdowns um, going on um, due to a pandemic, not the um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, but um, Ebola. Um, so Senegal shut borders and there were a couple of Ebola positive um, people who traveled through Senegal. There was no community spread that we knew of, but the government shut down the mines for some period of time. And just, um, there were villages that were bulldozed. <clears throat> and so there was a huge dislocation um, of all the, any institutional um, programming around this. Um, the Peace Corps volunteers who came behind us I think continued to engage for a couple of years. Um, the District Health Center, un unfortunately, um, and this is very, very sad, had an accident um, where one of their um, land cruisers that was traveling to one of these villages for um, not anything to do with this Mercury project, but just to conduct some um, almost like mission work. There was a dental surgeon, um, a couple of nurses, um, a driver, and a community health worker who um, collided with an industrial mining vehicle and they were all killed. And that, um, after and around that time, Dr. Njai left as well um, and said he was never gonna come back um, because he was, he was very, very heartbroken, and it was we had we were gone by then. Um, so yeah, there's it's really hard to know what what things look like there right now in terms of this work. My counterpart, who was one of the ISA um, community health workers, is now the president of the district council of Saria, and this is something that was close to his heart, and it's. For that reason, I'm confident that there is still um, motivation among local policymakers um, around this. Minds have grown. Um, the government, it feels like, has kind of given up on trying to encourage boundaries around the mining. Um, yep. from, from what I hear, um, it's it's kind of a, like people don't really farm as much anymore. Um, a lot of people are full-time miners permanently now who had been farmers most of the time. So yeah, it's, I wish, I wish there could have been the establishment of a formal um, cooperative among miners while we were, I, I wish that could have happened. I think it still can, um, but it's currently not in place. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that question. Um, let's see, we have a, uh, a comment in the chat. Uh, the cooperation with the technical high school to make the retorts was a big piece of enduring sensibility on the technology distribution side. Um, so that's from Ann Lynn. Uh, Wayne, and I suppose that's your, uh, that's your, your spot. Yeah. Patrick. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, any, we still have a few minutes. Any, any other questions? I have a question, Gil. Go um, ahead, Curtis. Yeah. Um, and Patrick, also, I'll also say this is an amazing Peace Corps 
um, uh, endeavor and uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, I was curious to know if there was any thought given to, and I apologize for making this sound too simplistic given the very complex situation you described, but was there any thought given to maybe um, approaching um, some sort of cooperative arrangement um, among the um, the like house level miners, whether or not that would be a way to, I guess, promote a safe um, environment for that process, or is, or are the security and privacy concerns just too much of a barrier? No, that's actually that was a that was kind of like level two, maybe level three of what we envisioned um, the work kind of morphing into. That was establishment of the OSM GIA, Artisanal Small Scale Miner. Um, I think Annie might know what GIA stands for. Um, but that uh, GIA in the Senegalese context is a co-op. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, I think. I think that that, you know, organization um, pr provides a lot of um, potential for addressing some of the concerns of this activity. All right, uh, thanks for the question, Curtis. Uh, any, any other questions? We have uh, maybe two minutes. Well, I was wondering, uh, Patrick, do you have any sense of, uh, I'm interested in these uh, peer educators, um, you know, can you give us a sense of maybe uh, what their background was? I mean, were they working with like a Ministry of Health? Were they local people, that sort of thing? Great question. <clears throat> they tended to be between the ages of probably 18 and 25. They were athletic engaged gold miners. Um, who were riding motorcycles fast, um, digging deep holes in the ground and hauling big sacks of ore up out of those holes. Um, but they tended to be friends of community health workers. And so community health workers in these communities oftentimes are highly respected individuals um, in their village. Um, they might be a distill, um, distributeur soin à domicile. Um, that's the, I'm sure I butchered that. Um, that's the formal um, National Malaria Control Program, malaria um, test and treat individual at the community level. Um, sometimes they're the village chief's um, child. Um, sometimes they're just some, like a teacher or someone who's just well-respected. So they were the friends of those community health workers. And they tended to be a, um, just a fun group of people to work with. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. Um, any, any last questions before we adjourn? No, we're about at our time limit. So uh, I wanna, Thank you, Patrick, uh, for your interesting uh, presentation and uh, remind folks that uh, we'll be here next week uh, on Monday again to hear uh, Judika Thayer uh, talk about uh, her project on HPD vaccination. All right, folks, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, you all take care. Thank you so much. <laughs>